it feels great to be back for our second panel discussion. Um, this time, the first person I want to ask a question to is Lana. Um, so social structures were pointed out both by Maria and Anvesha in regard to the digitization of money as they influence the way tools are used and distributed. Um, in those contexts, that influence is rather visible. For example, as Maria just said, uh, with men and community leaders being the ones in charge of iPads, um, and when looking at Europe, we also have those social structures, obviously, that have influences but are harder to pinpoint and grasp. So Lana, how do you see those structures might still be influencing how tools are distributed here in Europe, for example, regarding gender? Hi, hi everyone, and uh, thanks for that question. It was really interesting uh, panel discussion so far, so I've learned so much. Uh, but to, to get to your answer, I think here in Europe where we can see the segregation is, um, is I think it goes beyond gender. It, we can see uh, within different age groups, uh, it's harder for uh, people to, uh, at the um, later age, to uh, access uh, various uh, services, uh, financial services. And we can also see some segregation happening when it comes to um, immigration and uh, immigrants. If you are new to Sweden uh, and, for example, come here, it takes time to get a um, bank account, which then uh, restricts your access to bank ID and you are excluded from the society um, until you um, can be, uh, yeah sorted with, with those practical things. And if we think about the gender structures, um, we all know that uh, majority of wealth is still uh, held by men. Um, and from, for that, from that perspective, uh, there are financial tools that are available to, uh, to those who have more capital uh, that are maybe less available for uh, the ones who do not have that type of capital and uh, in terms of gender that uh, makes uh, women at a disadvantage. So that will be some of the examples that we have here in Europe. Thank you, Lana. Um, so the next question goes to Elin. Um, in the Nordics, uh, as we heard from Daniel as well, we're very far ahead with the tech trends, especially compared to the rest of the world. Our technology here are evolving at an extremely rapid pace. So Elin, what challenges do you see that we might be facing due to this fast pace regarding financial literacy? And uh, what do fintech companies, banks, and other players have to do to kind of catch up with these developments? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Yes, yeah, so basically these like emerging technologies are making financial products and services more access widely accessible, but also more complex for the regular consumer to handle. Uh, young people entering adulthood today are facing much more challenging financial decisions than previous generations. This goes back a bit to what Daniel was talking about previously, but like young people of today have, for instance, cryptocurrencies, buy now, pay later payment methods, virtual economies and microtransactions at their fingertips. And adding to that, at the same time, this generation is more likely to have to deal with challenges such as longevity, automated labor markets and increased individual financial responsibilities, according to the OECD. Um, so this might not be like a 100% accurate metaphor, but it's kind of like we are giving children a very advanced Lego building set without the instructions on how to properly like put the pieces together. If, but if done right, this like could turn out to be like a magnificent construction. Uh, so I believe that like these emerging technologies have a great potential to improve the everyday lives of people, but we need to take responsibility to ensure that children actually do have the skills and knowledge that they need to navigate this new financial landscape when growing up. And like, of course, they should learn this in school, but we also need to team up and create products to simplify the teaching processes also for parents because uh, financial socialization is like proven to be one of the strongest mediators of financial literacy in children, kind of. Thank you. Uh, with that, I will give it to you, Lana, to uh, what do you say about that same question? Uh, very good perspective. The only thing that I would add there is that there is an overflow and uh, 
readily available information that is very hard to digest and that's about financial services that's about any any area uh, that you can think of there's information overload and um, for most people it is hard to grasp uh, that so uh, to uh, to Elin's point uh, we need to make it simple and need to make it accessible and uh, and of course, there is also a governmental role uh, that must be played most of the time. It's uh, reactive, as we can see with the buy now, pay later, those type of, you know, the SMS loans and uh, the type of services that uh, often can be seen as uh, sharky uh, towards the consumer. So government has to play a role as well to protect the consumer. And, and they are, but sometimes it uh, happens relatively slow, especially uh, with the speed that things are evolving and now they're accessible and to be fair there's some things like what we talked about cri uh, cryptocurrencies like there's only that much what government can do in regulating them um, so uh, yeah helping to digest information and um, at the point of purchase or at the point of uh, usage of the service uh, informing the user of the consequences and really making sure that they understand Thank you, Lana. Uh, before that, you also already shared your view around the influence of social structures. So I want to come back to that and uh, ask Alexandra, what are your thoughts on that question? Thank you. And thank you all. You're so great. I love listening to you. Uh, I think like two vital, I come from a like, youth perspective and I think two vital factors is like, we still have stereotypes in like who can be financial literate, who is in the like tech industry. And for example, I'm an mentor in like a suburban, uh, suburban school and I'm a lawyer. And they told me like be, even being a lawyer is so far fetched for them. They don't even like want to go to law school. And of course, this also affects like stereotypes uh, for in the tech industry. And the problem is that if we don't even have that uh, youths that are women or youths or people of color that goes into these industries, it happens like Alexia said, that uh, the apps are not formed for these kinds of groups. They're still formed for the people that use them and that creates them. And we can even see like in low-income families that are often represented by people of color that they even get disproportionately affected by school. And school is like heavily, like people said, like school will be easier now with the internet, but it's still not because we don't even know what kind of information we need. And for example, with finance, people have like hard time understanding why it's so valuable. But I do believe in a shift because we do have the opportunity to make this much more rapid thanks to technology, but it has to come like in a very personal level, I believe, in order to build trust with these communities. Thank you for that perspective. Um, Anvesha also touched upon the role of policies that form uh, how a society transforms towards a cashless society. Um, Magdalena, how do you see the role of policies in this transformation and what may people need from the public sector to be equipped for the fast pace of technology in the financial industry, in your opinion? Magdalena, I think you might be muted. You're absolutely right. It's not <laughs> often that I'm mute. I will try and deliver a, a substantial rant to make up for that moment of silence. So just to contextualize uh, my point of view is I'm hosting a very, very long, long running show in Sweden called Lyxfällan, freely translated into the luxury trap. Luxury because we are dealing with first world problems very different from, from the previous speeches uh, from, from, from the rest of Europe. So uh, we meet on a weekly basis people uh, who have for various reasons uh, found themselves in financial predicaments, uh, mostly these days from overspending. Uh, also something that I've noted is that our applicants are increasingly younger and younger and we just try and help them both short term by uh, negotiating with their, their very, very bad credits and also by educating them in, in fundamentals about only spending money that you don't have. And believe it or not, the most 
successful pedagogical mom element of this whole show is us using a old school blackboard like that our teachers would use in the 70s uh, displaying using cash uh, this is how the individual spends their money and physic visualizing uh, the overspending and every week I, I get the feedback that oh my god I had no idea that I was using this much money so this is a very very concrete consequence of not using cash, not seeing how much is being spent. Now, let me uh, use the reference of widely used consumer goods such as cigarettes or alcohol. In Sweden, uh, these products contain a warning text and sometimes even very, very graphic images of the dangers with overconsumption of cigarettes or alcohol or snus, whatnot. My question is, how come consumer credits are are and or or like why are they not marked with proper information such as the compound interest or the actual complete cost of credit the truth is from my perspective and i've seen it for some years now the average citizen does not grasp the the what does interest rate mean how much money it actually uh will end up being so this puts a big responsibility of the government of legislators and policy makers and of course schools but as for as for policies they need to put a lid on or actually a roof on how much can credit companies make of unknowing clueless consumers who don't understand what they're actually signing up for. Uh, so this is actually me throwing a open glove to Finance Inspektionen, who are, you know, th their job, their task from the government is consumer protect protection. My uh, experience from what I see is that they are failing in this task, this needs to be addressed. And the, the current consumer uh, protection law says that there is an upper limit of a 40% uh, interest rate. Well, let me tell you that that upper limit does not help a person who will be paying this loan, who has signed up for paying this loan over a period of 15 years. This will still end up to a, excuse my French, shitload of money that this person most likely will never have. So what people need from the public sector is uh, to know that the whole financial sector is equally controlled and regulated, not just the bigger banks, but all uh, credit institutes who are for some reason, even though they're, they're, you know, they're settled in Malta or Cyprus, everybody wants to come from to Sweden and even me uh, taping my ninth season of this show I every week see new credit companies that I have not seen before they are popping up like you know mushrooms in a in a in a forest uh, and also I, I I I do know that the legislators are looking at you know maybe upgrading consumer protection blah 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 I have been browsing through uh, these proposals and I am not impressed. Uh, I would like to see just some more forceful uh, policies. Thank you. Uh, I really like the metaphor with the cigarettes. Very interesting. Uh, and actually, you also said the visualization and uh, and the board. That's uh, very, very fitting to, to my next question. Um, so Maria showed that there are, independent of the context, there are some things that are always kind of the same regarding uh, financial literacy, like core elements, for example, using visualization to actually teach the value of money linked with then creating engagement. Um, and so I want to ask Eileen, what do you see as the unique challenges and opportunities for financial literacy that come with moving towards a cashless society in that aspect? Okay, well, like, so from my perspective, like one of the greatest challenges as I see it as, is that like fewer children are even like getting an allowance when society is transitioning away from cash, like grown-ups, like 
i.e. their parents, are like uh, almost exclusively use digital services for their everyday finances, but there are few options available for managing their children's money. So instead of dashing to the ATM every like Friday after work, parents tend to pay for what their children want whenever they want it. So like we need to build financial services that better fit into the everyday lives of families, making like money more accessible for children again. Uh, but this also ties back to like um, with respect to the educational aspects that you were like primarily asking about uh, of cash versus digital money. That's actually where I see the greatest opportunities to learn right uh, today. Uh, so like today's children are growing up in a digitized world where smart devices are a natural part of their everyday lives. And for them, digits on the screen may be more natural than coins in a piggy bank, at least at a certain age. And as surprising as that might sound for some of you listening in now, there is actually a new released uh, research report indicating that already eight to nine year olds have no more difficulties understanding digital money than cash. And with digital technologies, we also have the opportunity to like ampli amplify the symbolic value and add functionalities that help children actually make even more sense of their money. And uh, in the long run, better prepared to face the financial challenges when entering adulthood that I talked about previously. So, for example, we can get children hooked on savings by visualizing the path to reaching a savings goal or different amounts can instantaneously like, be translated into items of value for that child. Or and deeper insights can be built to visualize the spending statistics or in behaviors, for instance. So, like, if you utilize the changes that are happening today, I believe that we can create even better learning conditions for our next generation that we have than we had so far with cash. Thank you, Elin. Um... I want to come back to something uh, that Maria and Vesha both pointed out, that uh, in the context that they work in, the role of the community is essential. So in the UK, Maria said that she sees a lot of these community aspects fade. Um, so exchange of cash in person is not really needed anymore because everything is possible remotely alone with your phone. Um, so Magdalena, I wanna ask you again, uh, what do you think does a cashless society do to our communities and how might this affect our next generation as well? Uh, well, let me tell you a story about when I was young, which was a while ago, I would get a few coins, you know, when we had smaller values of, of money, I would bring them to the candy store. And even before actually grasping the value of every coin, I would point at a couple of pieces of candy and then ask the, the, la the vendor lady, like, so, so how much have I spent? Oh, you got a krona left. Okay, in that case, I want blah, 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 blah. And then lo and behold, the, my pocket is empty. I get my bag of candy and I know that after spending, I have, I have nothing left. So I chose to spend my money and voila, I have no more. Today's children uh, get no chance of, of getting the correlation between choosing one thing and spending money and then having none left and having to abstain from, um, from other sorts of, uh, of consumption. Um, so that means that they grow up and they obviously have a harder time with realizing that even though I have no money in my wallet or in my bank account because it's digital, I cannot buy this cell phone or this piece of clothing or even this trip now. They never learned from the start. And, you know, this in combination with very aggressive uh, credit companies who, you know, not will only send emails these days, they will actually even call you and say, you know what, treat yourself. Why don't you go, you know, spend whatever. What do you think this leads to? Currently, we have a higher pressure than ever in the Kronofogde Myndigheten, which is like the, the last outpost of before financial personal bankruptcy. Uh, re like freshly become 18 year olds are already in debt over their heads and possibly never being able to pay back their debts from and this is because for, for lack of knowledge, 
Um, so they are applying to our show. They are filing for personal bankruptcy at a very, very young age. And the problem is with, uh, in Sweden, we have this system of skuldsanering, meaning that if you cannot uh, over a foreseeable future uh, pay your debts, you, we will uh, take your, the, the money from your, uh, from, your, from your salary, you will live on a absolute minimum over a period of five years, and then the rest, the rest of your debt will be uh, lifted. However, at this young age of 18 or 20 or even 25, you know, the, you still have some good 40, 50 years of work ahead of you. So you will absolutely not be granted a version of bankruptcy. Instead, these kids will be, you know, living on a minimum and a shit quality of life for the rest of, of their lives because they didn't understand the, the, the correlation of using money, be it cash or be it digital, uh, and overspending and what that you know will lead to. Thank you, uh, Alexandra. What are your th thoughts on the same question? Um, I will talk from the perspective of youth. We actually asked our youth, and seventy percent are positive to this trend uh, for the communities. And I actually agree because if you look from the point of view of the communities, uh, we depersonalize companies. And I think it's good because instead of getting a connection with the company, we can spend our time and energy with true communities like our friends, our family, and this part instead of building connections with companies. Though I do believe there's a like, bad side of this, and that is depersonalization of the company also leads to like disorientation because we don't no longer know who to like talk to if a like, problem occurs. Uh, because beforehand we just go down to the store and we can talk to the local store and like oh i need help i don't understand what's happening but now for example like facebook or amazon i don't know how to contact and i don't really have trust in all these services because it feels like a robot is talking to me thank you thanks that that was a, a nice uh, different perspective on on the same uh, question so i can say uh, many many thanks uh, to the panel for uh, both panel discussions for interesting discussions and insights i thought it was a great way to to bring the speaker sessions uh, into into discussions and to life